Today we will be discussing Trump's COVID diagnosis as well as layoffs from OC's largest employer, Disneyland. Followed by a look at protesters across the CSU system and whether or not Halloween is forecast to be canceled this year. And finally, we're committed to bringing you the news, views, and info to go on this episode of The Report Roundtable Discussion. I'm Jorge Flores. I'm Andrea Carvajal. I'm Amanda Mendoza. And I'm Brie Eastleck. And as you can see, we're continuing to practice social distancing and are going to conduct our episodes via Zoom for the foreseeable future. Although we can't be together in person, we invite you all to continue to be a part of the discussion. Follow us on Twitter at the report CSUF or on our Titan TV Instagram at Titan TV CSUF to keep in touch with us and view our new content. Let's start because we begin today's episode with news that broke late last week, just days after President Trump's comment about Joe Biden's mask during the presidential debate. Trump announced on Twitter that he and the first lady contracted a coronavirus last weekend. However, the news did not stop there. Controversy surrounding the president's true condition came into question after he was transported to Walter Reed Hospital for treatment. The president has left that hospital last Monday and is now back at the White House. For more information, we turn to CNN reporter Joe Johns. A reckless return to the White House for President Trump, leaving Walter Reed National Military Medical Center just 72 hours after being admitted for coronavirus treatment. While likely contagious, Trump still removing his mask on the White House balcony to pose for photos in his highly produced homecoming before going inside. As the coronavirus has killed more than 210,000 Americans, the president's move stunning some health experts. It's unexplainable that the president of the United States, who's actively shedding virus, it's really hard to understand how no one told him not to do that. Earlier, Trump announcing his planned departure from the hospital in a tweet, writing, don't be afraid of COVID, don't let it dominate your life. Despite allowing him to go home, the president's physician says he's still not fully clear of COVID-19. Though he may not entirely be out of the woods yet, the team and I agree that all our evaluations, and most importantly, his clinical status, support the president's safe return home. Following a whirlwind weekend that included putting his own Secret Service detail at risk to wave at supporters and Trump's claims that his health is improving, the outbreak within the White House continues. Press Secretary Kayleigh McEnany joining the growing list of Trump administration officials testing positive. Former Vice President Joe Biden reporting another negative test for the coronavirus and asking Trump to follow safety guidelines and stop downplaying the pandemic. The only thing I heard was one of the tweets saying that, you know, don't be so concerned about all this, essentially. It's a serious problem. Now, I just want to give you a little bit of context, and I want to know your opinion. First of all, I mean, it's sad that the president got coronavirus, and I just need to, to say that was, the thing is that after he, he got it and after he's now back into duty, he took off his face mask. So what is he trying to portray to people? Of course, we understand that his main point of view is that we need to be strong enough and that the coronavirus is not that bad for us that we, that we can go over. The thing is that, do you think that was like the best way of expressing just like taking off the face mask while other politicians that are telling us every single day to wear it? What do you think, guys? What do you think, Brianna? Absolutely. I think it was completely selfish. I think it was inconsiderate of the people around him. And like he went to go and greet his fans after he was tested positive, after he was leaving the hospital and everything. And I think it was completely inconsiderate of his fans and his secret service who had to be there around him. But what I really want to talk about also is his tweet. He stated, quote, don't be afraid of COVID. Don't let it dominate your life, end quote. Now, by him saying that, it sounds as if people are getting COVID and they, whether they had a choice or not, whether to get it, you know, and it's completely unsympathetic towards those who lost their family members to this virus. Amanda Klutz, whose husband was Nick Cadero, who was a big Broadway star and passed away after a 95 day fight with COVID. She took to Instagram and Twitter to react to the president's tweet and stated, quote, unfortunately, it did dominate our lives, didn't it? And she also wrote on Instagram, unfortunately, not everyone is lucky enough to spend two days in the hospital. I cried next to my husband for 95 days watch, watching what COVID did to the person I love. It is something to be afraid of. Now, people didn't get to say goodbye to their family members. They watched them go into the hospital and they never saw them come back out and they weren't allowed to visit them. So to say this and, you know, to say that out to the public is completely unconsiderate to them and kind of makes them seem like they're in the wrong because they got the virus. So I think it's terrible that the president in the United States would come out and say this. 
What about you, Andrea? For me, his diagnosis is confusing as he continues to tweet and say he is feeling good. And like you said, he isn't afraid or don't be afraid of COVID. But then his doctors go and say that he's not out of the woods. He's still, ha he's making progress, but he's not all the way there. So it's almost like, what is the truth? And those testing positive continue to grow in numbers around the president, like Hope Hicks, there were two US senators that tested positive. And with Trump being so negligent about how serious this is, it is causing a lot of commotion on whether the virus is real as he continues to downplay it. With only three days in the hospital, he puts so many people around him as well as himself at risk. And with the vice president debate going to happen, it should be interesting to see if there's any new precautions that will occur. What about you, Amanda? I actually agree with what Bree said earlier. I think we need to take off his mask and salute it in front of a crowd. I think that was very inconsiderate and reckless. And they also think his intent behind that was to coax his supporters who don't believe COVID is real or as big of a threat as it is, despite the fact that COVID's death toll is 210 thousand in the United States. I also think there's a lot of distrust going on with the American people and the White House as, like you said, Andrea, we're hearing different things from different people and we don't know Trump's current condition. And I think that concerns me that we can't have that level of trust with the government to even know whether or not our president is doing well. And yet he's making all of these shows to prove something, to prove that he's okay and that he's healthy enough to stand up and go back to the White House. But in the end, I think he's still endangering his staff. Let's move on to our next story. The OC's largest employer is reportedly taking a big hit. Disneyland recently announced a mass layoff of 28,000 employees across the United States, primarily affecting Disney's parks, experiences, and products unit. Part-time workers will be the most affected, making up 67% of the layoffs. According to the chairman of Disney Parks, Josh DeMauro, the employee cuts were necessary due to the, quote, prolonged effects of the pandemic on their business. DeMauro also placed a partial blame of this on the state of California for, quote, its unwillingness to lift restrictions that would allow for a Disneyland to reopen, end quote. Now there is no date in sight for Disneyland to reopen and my heart goes out to all the employees, especially those from Cal State Fullerton students that did get laid off. According to CNN, Josh DeMauro said, we look forward to providing opportunities when, where we can for them to return. This is definitely affecting Orange County's economy, but layoffs are nothing new since the pandemic began. Do you believe other amusement parks will administer layoffs? I know Knott's Berry Farm and the OC Fair offering these food tours without any rides operating. How will this affect Anaheim? What are your thoughts, Jorge? Great question, Andrea. Well, first of all, my heart and also my mind goes to the people that were just laid off. It's very hard to be laid off during this pandemic because now that you don't have a job, it's, it's going to be very difficult for you to find another one. I believe in, in progressive uh, reopening stations. And what I mean by, uh, by this is that uh, Disney should go slow by slow, trying to reopen the park as soon as possible in favor of the business and of the employees, the thing is that we gotta be very cautious on under what conditions, because the most important part here are consumers, because we know that Disney is a big corporation. So I don't think that they lack money. I think they have more money than they could offer to the employees, and that will show a lot of the values from the corporation, from the company. What do you think, Amanda? I agree. I think if they decide to try and spend some of their money to ensure that these people can keep their jobs, it'll be a very good statement from the company. But what I also found very interesting is that according to the Dislander.com, one of California's draft reopening guidelines states that if they decide to open up, it must operate at 25% capacity and they have to initially only open the park to people living within 120 mile radius and it can only reopen once the county reaches quotes minimal unquote risk level these were one of the draft guidelines that was sent to these theme parks if they want to open however they were revoked in july so do you guys think that if we had these guidelines, that would be appropriate for them to open back up and that perhaps these people could have their jobs again? 
Absolutely. I think that there's going to be a bunch of guidelines that they're going to have to follow. But if we look at Disney World, Disney World has been open since July. And, and I understand that they have a lot less people in, in Florida than California. And California has a lot of cases. But I think it's time for Disneyland to reopen. They've had Downtown Disney open for some time now, and they've been doing great. Also, let's look at Disney World, though. What they've done was they made a majority of their food places introduce online ordering. They don't have to wait in line. And they've also, they closed down rides every hour, I believe, to completely, thoroughly clean the rides. You know, they're bringing, they're bringing in all these new ways to make it safe for people to come. And Disneyland is not asking to open at 100% capacity. They're asking to open, to get people back in their job and to get people back to a little bit of normalness. You know, they want to have Orange County make more money off of Disneyland. Now, I think that once they really reopen and possibly when the pandemic ends, I'm really hoping that they're going to give those who are laid off, you know, the first chance to get their jobs back. And I truly think that Disney, the way they are, I really think that they'll be doing that. But you know what, guys, let's head over to a little bit more of campus news and speak of more layoffs. More than 70 CSUF staff members were also recently let go due to the pandemic. In response to these decisions, not only at Fullerton, but across the CSU system, faculty and employees of the California State University Employees Union organized last Saturday to protest along Nutwood Avenue and Yorba Linda Boulevard. Although CSU finances took a major dip, many pointed out that the $1.5 billion surplus that the CSU system holds to reduce the needs for layoffs. In a Zoom call last month, Assembly Member Sharon Quirk Silva questioned why the CSU was not using these funds, according to the Daily Titan. Now, guys, many of these layoffs, they're essential workers from the custodial environment, health, and safety departments. You know, these are essential workers. We need them. We need them here. And I understand that they're not working as much right now, but what are they going to be doing with that $1.5 billion? Why did, what do they need it for? And why haven't they really been using it? Now, the Daily Titan reported that CSU, that current CSU ch Chancellor Timothy White's salary is $478,000 and his recently named successor, Joseph Castro, will start at a salary of $625,000 in January. Teachers are criticizing why these employees are making so much and then they're letting off 70 employees. Now, if I was a higher up and I'd, I'd always try and find a way to keep these employees, especially in a time like this. What do you guys think? What would you do? You know, something very important that we got to recognize is the same thing just as the Disney Corporation. I mean, they're a big corporation. Imagine like that amount of money they produce. Now, we're talking here, like you just said, uh, Brie, about CSUF. They got like $1.5 billion of surplus. I mean, of course, if I just think it that way, me as a student, I'm angry. Like, of course, they should use like that money to the teachers. Now, imagine the, the emotions and the feelings of those teachers which, which just got like laid off. I think that's that's not fair at all. And I think there's a problem when it comes to the management of the CSUF. I think they should do something in favor of the people that they are working with your corporation, with your business, with your school. And this is a perfect moment to use that money. Because if it's not during a pandemic that we know it's something that we're living these weird times, then when are you going to use that money that is supposedly used for times like this? I believe we will continue to see this more layoffs as California remains with strict guidelines. And it's awful to see this because like Bree said, these are essential workers. These are people that have bills to pay. There's no warning of these layoffs and it's tough for everyone. These Cal State University systems that are being laid off are those who provide direct services to students. And it's super sad to see, but I hope that they will fix the situation and make it better. Exactly. Okay, now let's talk about something a little more local or something that's coming up soon. With Halloween just around the corner, according to a survey by the National Retail Federation, more than 148 million Americans still plan to take part in Halloween-related activities this year. The CDC has made a list of creative new ways to get into the spirit while staying safe, such as planning distant scavenger hunts and virtual pumpkin carving parties, same a few. This Halloween will surely look different from the, from the traditional norm, but by exactly how much? For more on what spooky season may look like, we turn to CNN reporter Mandy Gaither. It will be a traditional Halloween by untraditional means, according to the National Retail Federation. At-home activities are keeping the holiday spirit alive. 53% plan to decorate their homes, 
46% plan to carve a pumpkin, and 18% will dress up their pet. Stores are stocking up to meet demand. While the NRF says fewer are celebrating this year, the ones who aren't shying away from Halloween shopping are expecting to spend $11 more on average for a total of more than $90 on average, spending a little more on home decorations, candy, and greeting cards. All that shopping is expected early. Some have already started. While fewer might be heading to stores, the top shopping destinations remain the same. Discount stores, specialty Halloween stores, grocery stores, and online retailers. The survey shows 30% of people polled will shop online. More than 2.7 million children plan to dress up. 2020's top three costumes, Princess, Spider-Man, and a superhero. For Consumer Watch, I'm Mandy Gaither. So everybody, keep in mind that flu season usually starts in October, and that's possible and that's possible to have both the flu and COVID, according to epidemiologist Dr. Seema Yasmin. Do you think that people will follow the CDC recommendations this year, knowing this information? No, I personally do not. I don't think that you know people are going to stay home, you know, and not have their kids trick or treat. I've seen a lot on Facebook, at least in my area, that they're still having their kids coming around and trick or treating. And I'm not going to let the kids all reach into the candy jar. I'm going to personally give them the candy so all those germs, you know, aren't getting into the candy bowl. Exactly, guys. We saw this in summer. Whenever like the beaches, they were open. Other people they just went to the beach, and the spike in cases they just go. They, they, it went up like quickly. So what are we trying to, to wait for this? I don't think it's a good idea to celebrate Halloween like outside. In my case, I'm going to celebrate like in my place with my loved ones and that's it. I think we gotta still stay safe. Let's see what happens and let's hope there's not a spike in, in cases. We know many people want to celebrate, but we are still in a pandemic. So like Jorge, I'll be home dressed up in a onesie with my dog watching scary movies. And I hope you guys all stay safe too. And with that, that's all the time we have today on the report roundtable discussion. Have a safe week, everyone, and stay tuned for more news, views, and info. I'm Andrea Carvalho. I'm Amanda Mendoza. I'm Bree Eastlick. And I'm Jorge Flores. And as always, stay fresh. Flirt.